wow, how can I follow that? This is going to bring us all back to Earth with a very, very big bump because, you know, we're looking there at presentations probably pretty close to terabits of bandwidth. We're going to come back down to about kilobits per second. But anyway, um, 1994 to 1997. Um, I think when I saw the Lynx Ethernet switch in the Science Museum of London while I was on some trip around in Asia, I was like, my goodness, maybe I'm getting old. But anyway, so I just wanted to do a, whoops, do a little bit of um, history. Um, I was asked um, by Curtis if I would go through some of the early days of Lynx. I mean, I realized that you know Paul Thornton presented... Um, last Lynx meeting from really from the time he started in 1997, and I think he covered about a couple of years there. And there have been various other historical things covered years before. Um, but I don't know if this has actually been, the, the details of say 94 to 97 have been covered in much detail recently, at least not for the, the new members. So um, before I plunge into it, a little bit about me, um, and I think it's kind of the same history that many of us um, here, at least on the technical side, have. Um, kind of got distracted when I was at university, um, doing my PhD and postdoc. I mean, I did all that anyway, but um, there was this IP thing was kind of just starting, and um, I was in the physics department, and I was using, well, HP 9000 Unix system for my research work, and it had this weird Ethernet thing at the back, and... You know, we could run cables downstairs into the lab and ended up getting really sidetracked with that, especially writing off to people in the US asking for a Class C address to number these things. It was all quite exciting. Um, I joined Pipex 1993 um, as a network support engineer, did that for five years. UUNet took us all over and it all became very UUNet. Won't really go into any of that. Um, joined Cisco in 1998, um, they wanted me to move to the US, I didn't really want to move to the US because they wanted me to work in the UUNet account, which I didn't really want to do at all. So because I like building things and doing network stuff and so forth, Asia Pacific was a hugely developing region for Cisco then and um, that's where I ended up. Um, moved to Australia, um, APNIC was moving from Tokyo to Brisbane at the same time. So um, I went along with Anne Lord, who was setting up APNIC um, as that. So we both left UUNet um, end of 92. Um, did Cisco for quite a few years, not any product or anything like that. It was really just go, go, go and do good stuff, make the internet better, and you know, let us know every month all the good things that you've done. So it was actually quite a nice role. And there was a couple of you commenting after my presentation yesterday about, you know, how, how do you manage to do all this? Cisco was actually very, very good at supporting internet infrastructure development work back in those days. Um, and they left a small group of us just to get on and do it. Um, but it all kind of imploded about 2010, 2009. I joined APNIC in 2011, did that for a couple of years. 2013, I tried to be very brave and work for myself. And that seems to be working out so far. Most of my work today is with the Network Startup Resource Center I mentioned yesterday. Um, and you know, most of that work's involved in research and education networking, building networks, universities, national research networks, and so forth. But we also do network operators and exchange points and so on. Anyway, UK Internet, 1992. Um, so UKNet really was the first operator providing some kind of commercial TCP IP. Um, as far as I, I remember it. And this is going through piles of old emails. I'm not just trying to remember things off the top of my head because memories, I don't know, seem to get you know, improved with age or something, or you remember things different ways. So in putting this together, I actually went through all the old emails from back, back then. Pipex started um, 1992. Parent company was selling FTP's uh, TCP IP stack for Windows. If anybody remembers Windows 2 or Windows 3 and so forth, that wonderful bit of software, of course it had no IP in it. Um, and so Unipalm was actually selling the TCP IP stack. But of course, one of the requirements was had to have IP connectivity. So the choice was buy a connection from UKNet or get your own link to the US. So the 
joint managing directors of Unipalm decided, no, we'll buy our own connection to the US and we'll start up a, a sort of, you know, an internet company to provide connectivity for our customers who are buying the FTP uh, TCP IP stack, which seemed quite a good idea. So March 1992, Pipex got going. Um, Demon Internet was uh, appeared around about that time as well, starting as a Pipex reseller and then split off to uh, focus on the consumer market. So they had a huge dial-up um, infrastructure, um, certainly going 93 and 94 onwards. So I joined January 93, as I mentioned, the 25th lease line customer not long after I joined, seven member staff, two pops, 99% availability. I know it sounds a bit crazy back then when you consider the routers and so forth, but that's what we offered. Um, of course, you can know we're operating the Janet IP service. Um, so that was probably the first IP backbone in the UK. Um, I don't remember which way around it was back then. Was it running on top of X25 or was it native? Don't remember. Um, but I was certainly playing with it when I was at university. Um, we had our IP connection um, from, from GIPS then. Um, and the way it worked, Pipex directly uh, peered with uh, GIPS and direct connection to UKNet and another one to Daemon. So you can see where this is going. We all had direct private links to each other, kind of. BT hadn't started yet. I mean, Nigel was uh, sitting in a lab somewhere experimenting with IP services and so forth, but nothing had actually appeared as yet. There was no BT net. May 1994, this was kind of interesting. ULCC had circulated a proposal to form a low-key neutral interconnect. So just a low-key one. We don't want to do any of these big DGIX things because there was a talk of DGIX, and I've got a little note about that later on. In the meantime, Pipex was also talking about an IX concept because the guys in Sweden were doing quite nicely with SEGIX. And so, oh, well, we need something like that here in the UK as well. And you know, there's interesting email exchange between the two parties of, oh, I didn't get to see your proposal. Well, you didn't share yours either. But you know, they were two independently doing that. August 1994, the fifth thereof, was the day. This is the day that this all started. <laughs> um, so how many years is that? That's far too many, 23 years. Um, not quite to the day, but just a few days after it. So maybe you know, two more years' time could plan the links meeting for the 5th of August. But that was the first meeting to discuss creating an exchange point in the UK. Um, I don't remember who all went there, but I certainly remember, at least from the Pipex side, it was um, Keith Mitchell, Richard Nuttall were heading off down to London. Um, the meeting was, well, Ucarna, Stroke, Janet folks, uh, Pipex there, BTNet had just been announced, um, so I believe it was Nigel who went, Demon Internet and EUNet GB, because EUNet, sorry, UKNet had just joined this EUNet alliance across Europe. So those were the five uh, first um, operators who met. Um, location. Well, the exchange point principle was agreed because everybody was paying huge amount of money to try and get to the US. Um, and also domestic interconnects had to be dealt with as well. A lot of money for that. In our case, we were running links to the other UK providers. And of course, when BTNet started, we were to run another connection to them. And it all starts adding up. So running just one connection to a common location made sense. And of course, Pipex proposed Tallyhouse. Yes, the good old Tallyhouse North. I'll talk about that in the next slide. BT suggested a uh, BT facility in the central London. I don't remember which, but um, I remember the, my colleagues coming back going, well, of course BT would propose that. And URCC was proposed um, by Ucarna, because I think that's where the actual GIPS knock was at the time. And so, you know, seems perfectly reasonable suggestions. But Tally House actually was agreed, but people were concerned that it was very remote. Well, if you remember Docklands around about that time, you kind of in a, in a war zone almost because it was there was not a lot there. It was going through the regeneration, and Tally House was this building with lots of vacant ground round about it. So it did feel a little bit remote. But for us sitting in Cambridge, well, you know, it was it was London. London was remote. Anyway, I only have the modern picture, but that's the building. 
but you know, it doesn't have that bridge that you see at the left of it back in the old days, and the great big moat in front of it to keep, what was it, the anti-blast moat or whatever it was. Uh, but that was the building. Um, now, we had put our point of presence in there um, in 1993. It was a kind of interesting discussion because Telehouse were kind of, I don't think it was Kevin Still, but it was kind of, what do you want to do this for? What's this internet thing? You know, it doesn't make any sense because they understood financial markets. You know, it was the backup for the trading floors in the city of London. And it was like, what do these weird internet people want to come in here? So we did manage to persuade them to give us space. For, I think it was for a couple of racks to start with. Um, and it became our second London point of presence because the first one out at Mercury, Brentside, next to Heathrow Airport, was just generally a pain to get into and a pain to deal with. And trying to get BT to install lease lines into a Mercury facility was not simple. So done enough of that. And you know, if you've driven Cambridge to Brentside often enough, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but ease to get to as well. M25 was being built or whatever was happening around about then. At least it was fairly chaotic. So looking at the infrastructure, this is taken straight from the, from the emails um, back then. You know, that was the rack that was going to go in, 45U high, 600 mil wide, you know, the usual rack, two six-way PDUs, Total price, £1,100, 10-day delivery. This was from the Pipex supplier. Tally House, there's the rental space, 7500 per annum. Um, that was Kevin Stills' informal quote at whatever meeting took place to consider it. Um, and then the installation cost would go on top of that as well. So that was 10th of August um, to get that initial rack in place. Um, so... Yes, so the orders were placed for the equipment rack, um, so it was our supplier because we already had, our supplier had already put a rack in there. Um, so one was the telco rack, so this was where the leased lines would be terminated, and then the one next door, physically next door to it, would be where the equipment goes. We had a two meg link between ourselves and um, Janet, and so we agreed that what we'd do is that link would be handed over to Janet so they would use it as the two meg link for them into the links itself. And of course, you know, we would get to um, links directly from Cambridge or from, from our own pop there. So that made it easy for the academic folks to get to the links. And then the discussion about Ethernet devices. Yeah, I'll come back to that. Um, second links, founders meeting held at Telehouse. I've got the names this time. Some of us are still around. Um, so th those were the folks there. So it was the second discussion, I, I guess, looking at the actual location and meeting with Kevin Still and um, Martin Skinner, that's the name, um, meeting with those folks to uh, explain what we're trying to do and what this was all about. And then there was the draft MOU. Um, this was like version 0 0.1. So, I mean, I was kind of interested about the governance discussion yesterday. I mean, the MOU has probably gone miles from, from here. But notice in the middle there, the links has two primary objectives, to provide efficient inter interconnectivity for the UK ISPs. Nice, like that. And the second one, to further the cause of the UK internet within Europe. Hmm, okay. That's an interesting one as well. I don't know where that's got to. I don't put that in my exchange point construction advice in doing my work these days. Um, but as you see as I go through this, the fact that the Lynx was one of the first in Europe was actually quite significant. Um, so maybe it did actually further the cause, even though there wasn't a sort of promotion of, of that cause. I mean, there's a much longer MOU draft there, but it's kind of interesting to, to, to look at the, this early doc. Installing the rack, um, I did that. Um, well, basically, the rack got shipped to Tally House. I had the great pleasure of unpacking it all and putting it in place, along with the help with the, the Tally House um, ops guys. I mean, they were just, well, they were kind of baffled about all of this, but interested as well, because I wasn't wearing a suit or tie or anything like that. I was pretty much, well, probably not even as well-dressed as I am now. And it's like, really strange internet people coming in and jeans and T-shirts and so forth. But look at the bits. Eight port, 10 base T, Ethernet hub. 
Yep, it was a time-based Ethernet hub, unmanaged, half-duplex, scary stuff. And it had a time-based two port on the back of it, so you could daisy-chain them together. Um, external DC power supply, of course. And we had a rack mount frame for it as well, so it didn't, just didn't dangle in the shelf. I don't know what happened to any of that. But you could actually put three side by side in a 19-inch rack. And that hub came from our pop in Cambridge, because, well, if, if you know or remember any of this stuff, Ethernet hub, half duplex, it can do about two megabits per second before everything just stops working. So our, we had run out of, um, I suppose, bandwidth in the Cambridge pop, and we bought a switch, a crescendo. Anyone remember crescendo? Anyway, so not that one. That's just a picture I stole off the internet because I can't find any of my old pictures anymore, although I know I have them. So maybe in future I can share some of the old pictures with you. But we had basically bought one of Cisco's first Ethernet switches for our Cambridge pop, and so we donated the hub to the Lynx. I don't know if it was the best donation in the world, but it got something happening. You know, it follows the ethos of, let's get packets moving and then worry about fixing it afterwards. Um, the press release. So this was the press release, and it was like the discussion around the press release. This was the agreed text of the five members and with Tally House, and everybody was going to announce it all on the same day. And it was it's kind of interesting looking at how some were, well, can we just hint about it? Or maybe, no. The same day, 12th of September 1994, this press release went out. So again, that's some of it. I think actually, it might be all of it. But notice, links, London Internet Neutral Exchange. The neutrals kind of disappeared from the name, and I'll mention that again a bit later on. And the connection will be at Docklands and, and so on. You'll get MOU, but you can look in again at the press release about some of the, the requirements of the ISPs that um, could actually join the links. So it was, it was kind of interesting initial press release. The links hub will contain Ethernet segments linking each provider's own router cited there. I guess that's kind of what we were trying to do. So that was the press release. And then we got the telehouse contract, similar terms and conditions as the Pipex ones when we set up our pop uh, the year earlier. But look at the equipment, Lynx Ethernet Hub, woohoo. BT were providing a Cisco 2500 series router and a DL2048V Megastream modem. Yep, museum time again. That was the two megabit modem. EUNet GB, 2500 series router, mega stream modem, only if they need it. Um, and you can now were shipping in an AGS router. I don't know if it was an AGS or an AGS plus. Physically, they were the same thing. Um, but those were the listed equipment in the contract. Of course, um, Demon didn't need because they were connecting back to the London office. We didn't need because we had a pop already in the building. Um, the term, three-year contract was signed. So we thought this thing was actually going to last more than a year or two. That was pretty good. Coordination fee they're charging, £1,000 a year. License fee, £7,500 a year. I haven't the foggiest what a license fee for Telehouse would even be. I guess it's some kind of hosting fee or something. But anyway, it's some, some of the, these old numbers. October, November. The first website, don't click on the link, doesn't work. In fact, it only was like that for a while because Richard had mocked that up on a temporary port before moving it to the actual uh, real thing. But that was actually the first one that went out to the members list saying, hey, I've got a website up. Got some address space. Now, the address space came from the DGIX address block. So this was assigned by SUNet for the global DGIX. And so links got a slash 24 out of that. So that was for the first member IP addresses. The idea was that in future, DGIX would just aggregate all this and we'll have some magic, wonderful, amazing global exchange point. Thank goodness that didn't happen. Um, so, yes, Yukana route, uh, went, router went in. Telehouse Docklands was called Nowheresville. You see that pop up in the mailing list quite a bit. I guess if you're in central London, going out to Docklands was a bit of a trek. Uh, I mean, the light rail was there, but it was quite a trek. For us, and even further off Remoteville, it was <laughs> um, a, you know, a trundle down the M M11. Um, so yeah, we moved our connections across, our private peering 
started going via the links. EUNETGB daemon was starting to swing the links out of ULCC into Tallyhouse and starting uh, reprovisioning with other uh, members. Yeah, the DGIX thing. So again, for the historians, May East uh, kicks West would join SE Gix in Sweden to be part of this distributed global internet exchange, DGIX. Paris was meant to be the fourth site, but I mean, Paris just didn't happen. I mean, there was so much politics. I mean, even, you know, I even remember the days, the how many exchange points were there in Paris in the early 2000s? Um, so Paris just didn't happen at all. There was some politics um, happening. Uh, there. So Lynx was actually pr being promoted by the members as, wow, you know, we could be the fourth DGIX site because we've got our story sorted out. Moving on. Uh, early 1995, so that's when the Pipex and EUNet GB uh, peering link came up, uh, was brought up at Lynx, and there was started to be interest from outside the five founders. NetConnect was the sixth one. Um, only should be one N there, but autocorrect somehow seems to want it to be two. Sorry, NetConnect. Um, they arrived in 1995 as member number six, Cisco 2511, um, and of course a DSU. So you can see why we needed the Talco rack to accommodate all these well, standalone um, mega stream modems. So let's look at the hub. Well, Pipex took two 10 base T ports because we had uh, two local pop routers there. Gyps took two for the AGS Plus. Don't know why, but anyway. Had two, Demon had one bridge back to London office. EUNet GB, one for the Cisco uh, 2501. BT, same thing. So there was one port left for NetConnect. So we started going, ooh, we're running out of port space. What if somebody else comes along? What do we do? I suddenly remember um, us going, hey, we've got another hub. Would you like one more hub? Um, but you know, this hub was a stopgap solution. Can you imagine today starting Exchange Point with an Ethernet hub? I mean, the exchanges I tend to help, we start with a gig, one gig, 10 gig uh, a, a switch now. You know, hubs were just incredible. Then, you know, there was, there was huge discussion on the mailing list. There was so much discussion about switches and so forth. So, you know, SMC Tiger switch, what was that? Uh, Networth, don't know either. You know, these are famous names. Well, SMC was known because they had the, the chipset, but Networth? Xylan, of course, disappeared. There were no model numbers or anything mentioned. And, of course, the Cisco Catalyst was the one that came up because, well, the Swedes are using it, therefore it should be just fine for us. And there was a start of the anything but Cisco as, as being in some of the implications in the, in the talk as well. The nice thing with the Catalyst was it was expandable by 100 megabits per second, the FIDI ports. Because remember, 1995 was the year that Fast Ethernet was ratified. So there was no Fast Ethernet as such. All the very, very brave early versions were starting to appear, but nothing that anybody would trust. So FIDI was how you go faster than 10 meg. Um, yes, the discussion went on, you know, it was like some members are saying, well, you know, this is national infrastructure, it's got to be really important, it's got to be good quality, you know, we can't just put in any old rubbish type thing. Looking at the track record of other exchange points, you know, we've got um, May East, um, SE Gigs, what was it, May East by then was the DEC Giga switch, was a big FIDI uh, switch, SE Gigs were using the Catalyst. Kix, of course, was still a Cisco 7010 router. Anybody who's ever been involved with Kix, um, yeah. I mean, I make, make mention later on about Kix. It was, yeah. The fact that, um, well, Palo Alto Exchange and all those happened is probably no surprise. But yeah, there was still layer three. Support for multicast was considered essential. Multicast, anyone? Members were worried about costs of the switch, but considered it actually quite essential. But from, at least from our point of view, sitting in Pipex was, we were very, very worried because the hub was dropping packets like crazy, absolute crazy. We had a two meg link, Cambridge, London. Um, the hub could only do about two megabits per second. So our link's port was two megabits per second, mostly to, to GIPS, actually. Um, and that was the uh, server that was hosted at ULCC was, um, drawing quite a lot of traffic. So it was just losing packets like crazy. 
There's also um, a view in the Higher Education Funding Councils that links was kind of a bit dodgy. It was like a, a backdoor way that the commercials, these horrible commercial people can get access to the um, academic and research um, network. So, you know, I guess I see that happen in many other parts of the world as well. But, you know, thankfully nothing came of the suspicion of the links and, you know, Janet was a very important member. So, the hub was dropping so badly that we actually ended up lending. We had a spare catalyst that we bought for upgrading one of our pops, so it was kind of, okay, Lynx is now so unreliable that it was pretty much, it was an email, I think I sent it out on the Tuesday the 16th or somebody, or maybe it was Keith, I don't remember. Um, okay, this is like emergency, how about install the switch? Which time will work? So early evening maintenance on the Thursday after everybody said yes on Wednesday. So just drive down. How about switching early evening? Yeah, it was 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Can you imagine doing that now? Because <laughs> the internet was really only really used during the day. There was no such thing as getting home from work and turning on YouTube or Netflix or something. And yeah, that's the very one. Thank you, Paul Thornton. I borrowed it from his slides. It's this London Science Museum picture. That's switch one. That was, I mean, I think it was loaned and it never, ever came back. Um, but that was the one that was, I, I don't remember which pop we got it for, but it was an emergency upgrade, eight port ethernet switch. Um, didn't solve the lack of ports problem, but at least we stopped dropping packets big time. Um, so the links became usable again. Um, who could be a member? Yeah, so this is interesting as well. Must have their own address space, must have their own AS number. Routing policy registered with RIPE, fair enough. Own international lease line capacity to the US. Had to include a trace route. In fact, several just to prove that it was going over your own capacity and not over a tunnel or anything else. Um, initially, it started off being the own route to the NSF net, you know, the National Science Foundation network in the US, but with that disappearing in 1995, um, that really couldn't work anymore. So it was just international you know, linked to the US. US was still the center of the internet back then. And a published tariff for domestic internet connectivity, including 64K leased line service. What can you do today on 64K? Nothing. So later on in 1995, there was more interest um, who, you know, from other operators, new operators to be members. So VBC Net, Technocom, INS, Cable Online. Um, Sprint International caused amazing, wow, you know, we're recognizing the international stage. Sprint wants to join. Ah, uh, hang on, Sprint International, not Sprint Link. Slight difference. Um, but still, it was a big interest um, because they were connecting to um, May East, the New York NAP, Kix, Ebon in Paris, SE Gigs, and of course, they were in Hong Kong and, and Japan as well. Um, annual membership fee went, well, was 2,000 pounds to contribute to the operation and hosting costs of the links. And in July 1995, one member penned this on the list. It is very clear that from EOF, European Operators Forum, remember those? Um, and the IEPG, which had just started that year, um, that links is now a very strong candidate for being the second most important internet interconnect in Europe after Stockholm, and it would be nice if we all acknowledge this in our interest and we get benefit from keeping it that way. So that was pretty big stuff. You know, this was the second exchange point, probably, um, that appeared in Europe, but really had a, a big presence um, like this. Third Links member meeting. I posted the agenda. I was comparing this agenda here with, well, the one for this meeting. I mean, where would you get an agenda item that says, how do we handle idiots? Maybe Curtis can put that up for the next meeting, I don't know. But that's what it says. But you know, it's just looking at, you're looking at some of the detail there, but these were some of the, the things, you know, there's no, inter, you know, no governance thing or whatever else. It's, you know, it's worried about the financial stasis, um, the technical updates, what else were the membership criteria. Because actually Sprint's application caused a problem. Because Sprint was transit provider for several existing Lynx members. And the Lynx membership rules didn't allow customers of members to join Lynx. 
So it's like, oh, we really want link, uh, sorry, Sprint at links, but we can't have Sprint because it would kick off some of the new members. What do we do? So it was really kind of interesting. Um, but you know, picking out bits from um, the meeting minutes, I focus on technical stuff. The political side just makes me go to sleep, really. But the, the technical bits are interesting. So there's the Paris EBS bogged down with the politics, so the Paris politics. A real desire to have Dante show up. Um, I mean, fine, we'll get a UK academic and research network, but none of the European infrastructure there. But Dante was like, damn it, no, we're not going to turn up at any exchange point. If you want access, you pay for it. Netherlands, nothing there. What else? Irish inter internet connection point coming online. They like the links model, so maybe that was the first hint of the Dublin exchange. Geneva interconnect point moving out of CERN. What else? Small-scale arrangement in Italy. I don't know which one exactly that was. Maybe it was Milan. Um, note that one. May East is far worse than Tally House. No, that was referring to the infrastructure or the, the exchange or whatever. But May East was in a car park. Yes, it absolutely was. And my first trip to May East was to you know, go to MFS. Can I visit May East? They gave me a... It's just a standard Yale key, and told me to go over to the car park. And then when I walked, well, it was a cleaner's cupboard in the car park, and the door wasn't even locked. And that was the center of the internet. Great. So at least Tally House was um, a decent building. You, well, what was interesting with Tally House was, and I shouldn't say this, but I will, the security guards were from Aberdeen. I am from Aberdeen. So when I turned up, they heard me talk. It was like, oh, where are you from? So we Trying to go and do a maintenance at 4 a.m. I turn up at 3.30. I spent half an hour just passing old times <laughs> before I could even get upstairs. So I suppose they were just happy to hear another Aberdeen accent in the East End of London. May, may ask going well. Kicks is held up by its members. There was real concern where to go. May East was seeing 150 megabits per second on the deck giga switch. That was the biggest exchange point. This is 1995. You know, 22 years later, we're worried about terabits. Um, so we ordered a second 1202 for uh, links, so a second one to join the first one. This was switch two. Um, and the one member, one port rule was implemented. Um, so we had to give up one of our ports. Um, GIPS had to give up one of their port. Um, and so those, those are the members at that particular point. The, the nice thing pardon me, with the two catalysts was they had a FIDI interface. Well, they had the external holes for it, but we didn't actually have the electronics from Cisco yet because they hadn't, whether they hadn't got it working properly, it was something like that. Anyway, the two uh, catalyst switches didn't actually have the FIDI. So we ended up just putting a, a CAT something or other, three maybe, cross-connect between the two switches pending the FIDI actually arriving. But at least we had 14 10 megabit half duplex ports, or full duplex if you could actually use it. So those were the port assignments, you know, way back 1995. So of course, you know, FIDI would be in future because, well, we didn't actually have the electronics yet, but you can see who was all connected back then. And of course, because there were some spare ports in the second switch, we just plugged in a backup port just in case. Um, Legal entity. Well, up to now, links had just been a loose association. You know, the five original founders plus some of the new members, and we agreed to be nice to each other, which was... I still find that is absolutely amazing that this happened. It's so rare today to find operators getting together to agree to set up an IX without some external, well, moderator, handholder, promoter, or pusher. Um, but discussion about the legal entity, so a links limited um, should be set up. And also, what should links do? Well, you know, some people were saying, well, links is an exchange point, and others were like, well, it should do the UK naming as well, because hey, you know, all of us here are also on the UK naming committee. Yes, any of you know the UK naming committee? It's just a mailing list, and somebody proposes a new name under .co.uk, the committee will go yes, no, or whatever else, or I object, and so forth. What a way of use of doing domains, but you know, Nigel remembers. Uh, I'm sure Mike remembers as well. <laughs> but 
What a way of doing it. But that's how it was done. And so it was the same people. So, hey, how about Lynx doing this? Okay. Um, and should Lynx run a UK operators forum as well? Well, so UCOF was proposed, and some people said, well, maybe that's not quite a nice name. So, of course, you know today you've now got UK NOF rather than UCOF. Um, right? But again, because the UK operators were coming to Lynx meetings. And so then we have the fourth member meeting. Highlights of that, forming the limited company. The name change, London Internet Neutral Exchange, became London Internet Exchange. Um, subtle difference, but the dropping of that neutral, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter, but I don't know. Going around the world, people are very, very insisting on emphasizing neutrality for the exchange points. And then oh, the big discussion about the, the switch. Because keeping add, adding eight port catalysts wasn't scaling. Some of the member ports were run starting to get pretty close to the 10 meg limit. And that was why we had, in Pipex, had a second port, because we were kind of worried it would run out of the 10 meg on the one. Um, big concern about 100 base T as untested technology. I mean, the Catalyst 5000 that Cisco promised, was it Catalyst? That was Kalpana, wasn't it? I think. Um, but they had a 12-port card that would do 100 meg. And people weren't sure if this 100 meg was just a 100 meg hub or that the Cisco could actually switch between the ports. And Cisco couldn't really tell us either. So there's this massive discussion about, you know, should we get this Catalyst 5000 with this untrusted technology? And then, you know, folks headed off investigating Wellfleet, and we remember them. 3Com, and we remember them. Um, as well. So there's a big discussion about it. More space was needed because the existing rack was starting to run out of space. And of course, the CAT 5000 is year big. Need room for that as well. Membership fee went up, 5000 a year, and a 5000 joining fee. Because, well, Catalyst 5000 is not cheap. You'll see in a, in a bit. Then Alantec came along and offered to donate a Lantec 7000 switch to Lynx. And it could do 10 base T, 100 base T, and FIDI. And then there was a big discussion about Alantec versus Cisco, so it's anything but Cisco versus, hey, let's try something different. It's free. Why not? It's got to be good. Well, SE Geeks had already evaluated Alantec and found it, nah, don't want, to, don't want to, not suitable for an IX. But anyway, at the fifth Lynx member meeting, Let's get it anyway, and let's go and play. So I can see there's a techie side anyway. Even though somebody's proved that it's maybe no good, let's try it. It may be different here. Maybe the weather is different or something. Um, and then we'll get the CAT 5000 if Cisco can confirm that they actually switch between the individual ports. Sixth meeting, 1996, CableTel hosted that. The first Lynx board members. That was the first Lynx Limited. So Cliff Stanford, Keith Mitchell, Richard Nuttall, Richard Almeida, Javid Mirza, and Nigel. Hello, Nigel. Um, also proposed the purchase of the Cisco 4500 route as a route collector. Right? So the idea was that every member would peer with this so we, we would know what's available. Um, so prospective members could come along to Lynx and say, oh, I can get all these V4 prefixes. So that was the proposal there. Of course, by the time it came around to being implemented, Cisco had gone, yeah, 4,500 now. 4,700 is what it is now. The logo was registered, and I spent half a day looking for my original Lynx T-shirt, and that was the first Lynx T-shirt, and I don't even have a picture of it, so, which is a great shame. But I'll, I'll carry on digging through my uh, wardrobe just to try and find it. I've kept some of these really old, meaningful ones. So this is what we were buying. Look at the prices. You know, Cat 5000, 10,720 for the uh, actual chassis. Interface cards of all the same price. That's kind of interesting. Um, and then, of course, the collector, the Cisco 4700. Total price after the 55% discount, 26,000 pounds. And people were going, <gasps> lot of money, lot, a lot of money, um, just for this um, interconnect thing. Scaling through 1996, so we're running out of ports now on the two uh, 1,200 switches. Uh, Cisco loaned a third one um, because they were late delivering the CAT 5000. 
So again, I stole the Cat 5000 picture out of Paul's presentation at the last Lynx meeting. So Cisco was saying, it's going to come, it's coming, it's coming, it never came. It finally showed up in April 1996, right? And that became switch zero. Look carefully at the back plane of it. I think, I think that's the real one because it's got the fast ethernet at the bottom. They've got the two line cards with fiddies. What's that one above? 10 meg breakout. 10 meg breakout. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I'll come back to it. Um, Alan Tech's switch offer disappeared because they got bought out by four systems. Ooh, what happened to four? The international transit rules started causing a lot of arguments as well because members must have their own independent international connectivity. So Lynx members couldn't sell to other Lynx members. That's what it was trying, that was the rules, um, which caused big issue with Sprint because Sprint had customers who were Lynx members. So the initial idea by the founders in 1994 was to stop resellers from joining Lynx. Right? So it's a kind of little bit of a private club, just for us. And resellers, no, 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 you, you, don't, you don't get in. You dare not do anything like that today. Lynx, open, neutral, anybody can join as long as you have an AS number and your own address space. That's all we do at exchange points today. So some of these early rules, as you can see, were starting to cause issues. The fewer rules, the better. And of course, you know, the big providers didn't want their customers to join links. I mean, Pipex especially, you see some of the internal discussions, which I can't share. It was like, how do we stop X? How do we stop Y? But, you know. Staffing. Full-time employee was considered mid-1996. Um, Keith started mid-July 1996. The UUNet takeover of Pipex, it finally got too much for him. Um, so he became the, the full-time employee at Lynx. And that point, I was kind of, gee, you know, every member wants to have a say, every member wants to do something. So all these committees and people taking responsibilities for things, I mean, I'd done a lot of the early, just plug things together and wire it up and so forth. It just felt like there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Not a criticism, I can understand why everybody wants to feel involved in, in the IX, but for scaling, you imagine today, if all 700 members wanted to come and help with some of the migrations and so forth, it just wouldn't work. But, you know, on the techie side, the BGP community attribute had just appeared, um, and there were proposals about maybe we should use this at Lynx. And I was kind of interested in the one this morning about, you know, the, the, the right origin um, authorization and um, using a community to indicate that. The flap damping, of course, um, Sean Duran had introduced that at Sprint, and, um, you know, my team at Pipex said, yeah, we're going to do this as well. It actually was very, very urgently needed for us. I mean, it, when we turned it on, it probably saved 30% of the CPU on our poor little routers. Yes, back to the 5000. So yes, so that RG, what is it, 21 connector that you saw earlier, needed one of these things, an RG21 to RG45 breakout cable. Okay, that meant we need to have a patch panel with back-to-back -back connectors and plug all these things in the back, and then so we could actually plug individual members into it, because that cable wasn't nearly long enough to reach every single member. So we had to have a, a patch panel um, mounted, mounted in the rack to do that. So that took a little bit longer to organize. So according to the discussion, it was July before the um, 10 meg interfaces actually became available for members. The new switch was very popular. Everybody wanted a 100 base T port. And, you know, it actually turned out the reason they wanted it so that they could market the fact that they had a 100 megabit connection to links. It's not 100 meg of traffic, but we've got a 100 meg connection to links, therefore we're in with the big boys. And so there was, again, a, quite a bit of discussion surrounding all that. You know, why does a new member want a 100 meg port? They've only just joined. So it was actually kind of popular. The FIDI interfaces had arrived for the 1200s, and so the CAT 5000 then had a FIDI connection to the, the two, uh, 1200s and the loaner from Cisco, which uh, was still there. Um, and so again, it was a discussion, well, what do we do? You know, we need to scale this. More members are asking for 100 meg ports. Uh, of course, the CAT 5000 was full, didn't have any more slots left in it, so we'll come back to what the cost should actually be. 
And of course, the advantage of having Keith on staff or having any staff at all is that a major tidy up could be done. Um, and so Keith spent, I don't know, probably the most of the month of August tidying up the rat's nest. Um, I mean, I said yesterday I wasn't going to show, share the uh, BDIX rat's nest in, in picture, but the Lynx one wasn't nearly so bad, but it was certainly one of the bad ones I've seen over the years. And so by the month end, with all his tidying up and migration, had, he had got everybody connected to either the Catalyst uh, 5000 or the 1200. Uh, what else? Out of band access, rat committee mailing list, kid you not, 10th Lynx member meeting. What else is interesting here? Um, talk about exchange points in other places, so Munich, May Frankfurt, DKIX Frankfurt, the various Paris interconnects, Telehouse New York were advertising their exchange point to Lynx members, which was kind of mumble grumble. Content regulation, safety net off-tell, PR agency, staffing proposals. And then, you know, one member complaining that Lynx was doing more than exchange point stuff. They were getting involved in other things. Followed by, you know, pointing out what went wrong at the kicks. You know, why kicks ended up being um, just basically falling to pieces. Because kicks was trying to be an ISP association as well as an, as an interconnect. And there was a lovely quote by Paul Vixi I didn't put on here that Lynx was, uh, sorry, Kix was just a connectivity between the, basically what is um, PAX and, and an SMDS cloud um, back then. Right, so peering matrix, that was maintained by hand. Um, all I can say here was, gosh, if we had peering DB back then, Richard Almeida's life would have been a lot simpler. The peering matrix was meant to show on a web page who was peering with who. And so by the end of 1996, two equipment racks, one telco rack, Catalyst 5000 needing more space. There was a collector in AS5459. And then the debate and discussion about a root name server in Europe. That was the time that um, IANA were looking at sites outside the US. So this is when we ended up with a root name server in Japan and another one here in Europe. Hosted at Lynx, but actually run by the RIPE NCC. I mean, Lynx wanted to host it, but I think IANA preferred, I don't know what it was, something more stable? No idea. And then growth carries on. Um, DKIX was considering a link um, to Lynx, which was kind of interesting, connecting that exchange here. Microsoft was asking about peering at Lynx directly, and I certainly know and, and from our point of view, they're a customer of ours. It was like, no, damn it, no, that's our major... Um, a source of revenue. So that was a kind of difficult one. Um, Surfnet were operating the new M6 in Amsterdam. That was at Nikhev and Sara uh, locations, Sphinx in Paris, the Minx in Madrid, IXs in Moscow and St. Petersburg, Tally House, New York, I mentioned before. And then heading off into 1997, we got the route server using RSD um, as a proposal. All members would peer with it, and then re redistributing rights according to policy that members published. The office in Peterborough updated MOU. Huge debate about that. Look at the joining fee, £10,000 annual membership, £5,000. More and more expensive to support the more and more things that we're trying to do. Job adverts for network engineer, full-time administrator, um, marketing, sales support, bookkeeper running out of space, this was the move to TFM6, uh, 400 square feet in their own place. March proposal 97 for Manchester NAP, uh, that was done by UNET and UCC, uh, which was meant to complement Lynx. Second site, Lynx proposed, this was the, meant to be a telehouse city, discussion about the FIDI switch. Plane tree, wave switch 4800 was the one that was proposed. I mean, this is 1997, that was two years after Fast Ethernet, yet we're still kind of, yeah, FIDI's going to have a future. Um, and no, no, our deck giga switch is way too big. I mean, this is a year before gigabit Ethernet started appearing, so it was kind of, I was baffled at that point, because Fast Ethernet, as far as I was concerned, was pretty much the future. Um, anyway, in Amsterdam, second M6 technical meeting, so M6 was starting getting running in 1997. Everybody remembers Internet Down, AS7007, Management Analysis Incorporated, lack of BGP filters. I told you I like techie stuff. You know, I never mind any of the, the politics, but this was kind of interesting because 
It was reported as the internet down, but we were quite smug here in the UK. Well, oh, we've got links, UK internet, it's just great. Actually, it was. I mean, while we had problems with US connectivity, because UUNet and Sprint were pretty much broken for two days, everything else seemed to work pretty well. And if you, again, looking at the member list, they were saying it all worked pretty well. Um, but this was all a software bug in a Bay Networks um, router that, that did all that. Um, the staffing, you probably know some of this looking back in the history. We've got the Peterborough office from 27th of May, 97. And if you remember, telehouse down, <laughs> when somebody managed to switch off half the building. Right? 8th of May, power to the south half of telehouse was switched off due to human error. They switched the switch the wrong way after a power surge came in from um, the outside supply. Yeah, that caused a lot of issues, but as far as Lynx goes, the Catalyst forgot its configuration on this fast Ethernet card. And so all the members were connected 100 meg, suddenly weren't connected when it came back. So that had to be fixed. But yeah, that one burnt out um, a lot of switches, routers, and so on. Uh, it caused quite a lot of issues for the members affected. Um, so it was kind of interesting. Lynx started its move, the K-root server arrived, the plane trees arrived. Collector runs out of memory, 50,000 entries in the BGP table. Woohoo! 1997, caused by a leak from AS 2041. They leaked 5,000, boom, just like that. That's 10% of the BGP table. Imagine leaking 10% a day, 60,000 extra prefixes, almost 70,000. So the 32 mega RAM 4700 replaced with a 40, 64 mega RAM 4700M. The move was all done usual delays, and then I, I really started losing interest after this, because it's talking about memorandums, articles of association, the quorum, bylaws, non-core activities. I woke up for the technical bits, so a six-bone status, a backup site, the server status, <sighs> links to 17 meeting, you know, politics, admin, bureaucracy. The links slash 23 wasn't enough, that headed back to uh, SUNet, and Lynx became its own LIR. Some members were kind of, what is Lynx? Uh, sorry, an exchange point need to be an LIR. But anyway, got its own slash 19. That's the 19 you know and love today. Um, and then it just started looking at more and more um, bits after that. And if you're interested in more after this, Paul has a great presentation, which he did at the last meeting. <laughs> uh, but that really is the, a high-speed version of, um, I know I've taken 55 minutes, probably 10 longer than I promised, but that's a high-speed version of the four years uh, before then. So if you got the sense from Paul's presentation, it was kind of, it worked somehow just. Before then, it worked somehow just as well. Um, I mean, that Ethernet hub, I've, I don't know what we were thinking, I don't know what was in the water in Cambridge at the time, but... I've not started any Ethernet exchange point with an Ethernet hub since. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. I think it's the break time now, anyway. But anyway, any questions, please l let me know or ask during the break. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>